Great. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Johannes, and I work on Swift Neo at Apple. And today, I would like to talk to you about testing Swift Neo systems. Uh, those systems are exactly the same kind of pesky systems that uh, Corey talked about yesterday. Um, but this time, we want to see how we can get them under control. Um, in the Swift Neo team, we take testing quite seriously. Um, but unfortunately, we find that in many other frameworks, testing is not made as easy as it could be. And I try to convince you today that Swift Neo is slightly differently. So we try to make it quite a lot easier for you to write tests for your code, and I think you really should do that. Um, the agenda for my talk um, is the following. First, we talk about testing network software in general. We move on to uh, looking at unit testing, network software with Swift Neo. And we finish up with like, some specialized testing tools for byte-to-message decoders and HTTP 1. Right. Let's face it. Testing network software is hard. To see why testing network software is hard, I prepared a very simple example. On the left side, we have an application that just does two right calls, sends hello, followed by world. On the right side, we have a very basic program that just spins in a while true loop, calls the, in this case, blocking read call, and just prints out in its own line whatever the read call returned. The question is, what is the output of this program? What most people expect is this kind of thing. It prints hello, new line, world. And this is certainly a correct answer. The unfortunate truth is that is not the only correct answer. It's also totally possible that this program print will print hello world in one line. Why is that the case? The reason for that is TCP, and that is the only thing I talk about today. So like every time I mention networking, I mean networking over TCP, is a stream. And you should think of it as a stream. It's not a message-based protocol, it's a stream. So the, the number of read and write calls that you issue or the number of packets that get sent over the network, they are not semantic. They shouldn't matter to us, uh, to you, and you must be prepared for that. Another situation that could happen is this. Arguably, this is quite unlikely, but it's totally possible. So packets or like your, your bits that you send in one write call could be re uh, two write calls could be reassembled, or one, one that you want send in one write call could be split up in two, and like who knows in how many reads that comes out of the other side. It's like totally doesn't matter. Another thing that could happen in theory is this, it prints hello and then nothing anymore. The best explanation for that I could come up, come up with is that the program that is sending the data just crashed in the middle, but you have no idea, right? You, you don't know what's going on. One more thing I would like to cover is this. It could print hello and then followed by some garbage. That might be surprising at first because you might have learned that uh, TCP is a reliable network protocol, and that's not wrong. Um, the problem with that is by default it is running on plain text. So every intermediate, intermediate peer, if it's a malicious peer, might change the data. And despite the fact that TCP has checksums, the malicious entity could just recalculate these checksums, and to the recipient, it will see like something that's totally legit. This particular issue can be solved by using TLS. You should all be doing that. With TLS, this is no longer possible. One final situation I want to cover is that one in prints hello, and then like you might have seen this error before, connection reset by peer. Not sure if you've seen that one, but I'm pretty sure you have. Um, these are not all the situations that can happen. I guess that's, that's pretty clear from this, but these are some of the situations. And I think that's a good motivation why testing network software is hard. Let's look into a couple of facts when you want to test TCP software. Again, it is a stream. Whether data arrives in one or more packets is not semantic. Whether data has been sent and one or more write calls, it's not semantic. The same applies to the read calls. Without TLS, the data can also be tampered with, and corruption is possible as well. The TCP checksums are quite weak. Um, that means um, arbitrary corruption, even without a malicious peer in the middle, is totally possible, or by, like, less likely. Another point that's quite annoying um, is that errors can happen in multiple places. So pretty much the same situation might lead to errors coming out of the read call or the write call. And assuming that you don't do only one of those two, it's really quite kind of hard to write something that rep reliably reproduces the situation that you would like to uh, reproduce. Perfect. Um, oh, God. I don't know what I clicked now. Maybe I should use this thing. I think I need to go forward. I think that's where we were. Um, to make it even worse, um, the only thing you can really use in your tests 
is localhost networking. Unfortunately, localhost networking isn't real networking, and in some cases, it doesn't even use the TCP stack of your system. It is something that, is, that fulfills all the guarantees that TCP gives, but it is a different stack. It's a bit different piece of software that's running in the kernel, or might at least be a different piece of software that's running in the kernel. That might lead to a situation that you have actually seen in the wild deployed on your customer side. You are potentially unable to reproduce it because the piece of software where this error is coming from isn't actually running when you're running your, when you're running your tests. Another fact that is surprising to many people is if the remote, clear, remote peer is closing the connection on us, that might lead to a clear shutdown the thing that we all expect, like we, we read EOF from the read, and like we know, okay, the other side closed the connection, fair. It could also re, uh, lead to connection reset by peer, and there's no real way for us to know what will happen. Connection reset by peer is actually very likely if you're sending data whilst the other peer is closing connection. In this one, I'm stretching the meaning of closing a little bit, but if the re re remote peer just crashed, also sort of, closing the connection, then absolutely nothing will happen. You will probably not detect this if you're only waiting for data from the other peer. The only way to reliably find out that a remote peer is gone is to actually send data to it. If you're not sending data to it, then probably nothing will happen. And you think, oh, that's still alive, but that might not actually be the truth. Those pesky distributed systems again. Bottom line is, forcing those behaviors in tests is hard or impossible. To get a better idea of why that is, let's look at this picture. I draw networks often like that. We have this remote peer, this iMac here, and like some kind of networking, which is the cloud. They're sending these TCP packets um, to each other. But the key bit is here, the TCP packets go into and come out of your kernel. Assuming you're not a kernel programmer, then unfortunately, that's not where you are, or actually fortunately, I should say. Uh, you will be operating in the process. In the process, you have these read and write system calls to tell the kernel what to do, and the kernel automatically does all the hard work in like, sending these packets back and forth, retransmitting the packets if they got lost, making sure nothing got, uh, like nothing got reordered, etc. That's all great. The problem with that is if you want to force a certain situation in a unit test, or in a test really, you would need to cause a certain setup with the packets, but there's no interface for you really to send these packets. You just send data and read data. We add Swift Neo to the picture. We have another layer on top of that. You don't really need to look at it right now. We'll zoom in uh, right after this. Swift Neo is another layer of abstraction, all by, like it's quite a thin one. We don't really abstract very much away that you could get with these read and write calls directly. Um, you can get pretty much exactly what they give you in Swift Neo as well. But yeah, let's zoom in on um, how I usually draw Swift Neo networking applications. For the people who have never used um, Swift Neo or have no idea how it's working, I give a very brief intro introduction. Swift Neo is a non-blocking, um, event-driven framework. That means when something happens on a network, Swift Neo, in this, like the, the channel which represents the network connection, would send you events, and you must handle these events. For example, when data um, arrives, so Swift Neo reads the data with the read system call from the kernel, this channel, the gray box, would send a channel read event through this pipeline. It would hit the first handler, which is the red one in this case, which may transform these events and send it to the blue handler. The top line that goes from the left to the right is we, what we call the inbound, the, inbound, um, um, the inbound pipeline. That is where all the events arrive that inform you about something that has already happened. So the Swift Neo literally just lets you know this happened, you go and deal with it. The bottom line that flows from the right to the left, we call it the outbound pipeline. And that is if you want to perform some actions on a network. So if you want to send some data, for example, you would use the write event. And when the write event traveled through all the pipeline and hits the channel, the channel would command and uh, would, would, uh, would um, comply to your, to your command and actually use the write system call to send the data over the network. Because the channel is always there, and like we kind of pretend that the kernel sends these events and receives these events, we don't actually need to draw the kernel. But that's why, how I usually draw Swift Neo network applications. One important point here is, and it might be made clear by this picture, the output of one channel handler is the input of the next channel handler. So on the inbound side, for example, whatever the red handler, whatever events the red handler is sending through this inbound pipeline is what the blue handler will receive. And that goes on to the back. On the outbound side, it's the other way around, but the point stays, every handler has a predecessor. If the green handler sends outbound events, that is what the blue handler will receive. 
And that is quite an important property, and I, I will now let you know why. The interesting bit here is every handler's input is the output of the previous handler. And we can, I think, use this property for something that is quite powerful. If you think back to my Hello World example at the beginning, there's really two extremes. One extreme is all the data arrives in one read, and the other extreme is all the data arrives one byte at a time, so we get the H, the E, the L, and so on and so forth. The second case is probably the harder one because it's unexpected, it's way less likely, and it's kind of like the extreme test case we would like to test for. Given this channel pipeline, we can perform a simple trick in SwiftNeo. We could add a new handler in front just for the test. We could call it the one byte at a time handler. And a, uh, an operation that this one byte at a time handler could perform is whatever data it receives in the channel read event, it would just split up in one byte sized chunks and send them through the pipeline individually. And to the red handler, this will look exactly as if the network were totally crazy and would send us the bytes one byte at a time. And that way, we can reproduce a situation that would, on an actual network, be hard slash impossible to reproduce. You could try it with like sleeps between the writes, maybe, but it would make your tests very slow and also very, um, very unstable. The code for this one byte at a time handler is actually not that complicated. We would declare it to be a channel inbound handler because we are one, we, we're listening to inbound events, so things that have happened on the network that you get informed about, such as um, data has been received. We declare the types, we receive byte buffers and send byte buffers. Byte buffers are Swift Neos byte container type, and then we just need to implement this channel read event. This channel read event gets called whenever there's data available. We take the byte buffer out of there. We while loop over um, this buffer whilst there are still bytes available. So each of this one byte slice will be a byte buffer that contains exactly one byte, and then we fire them through the pipeline one by one. So whatever handler is after the one byte at a time handler will now see the data only one byte at a time. And that is quite a powerful tool to reproduce a situation that is almost I impossible to reproduce in the real world. Let's talk more about these channel handlers in the channel pipeline. They allow you to modify, add, and remove any event. The one byte at a time handler is just like modifying slash adding some events. Um, a channel handler's input are the outputs of the previous channel handler and nothing else. And that is a huge win for testability on its own, in its own right, because now we can try to emulate certain situations just by sending or dropping or whatever we want um, to the events. But now, let's talk about unit testing software in Swift Neo. So far, we've still seen an integration test. So we still had a network, many handlers, and we just added new handlers to, uh, to emulate certain situations. Unit testing, however, in the purest sense, is really testing one unit. So a very thin slice of your application, the thinnest slice you can possibly test. To motivate this, um, let's look at this little example. We have a client, symbolized by the iPhone, who wants to know uh, what hi means in French. Um, it might use this very simple HTTP 1 API, sends it to the server, the server happens to know French and replies, uh, well, hi in French means salut, and replies back. So that's the motivating example. If you were so inclined and implemented the whole application, both client and server in Swift Neo, you would probably have something like this. You would have two channels. The channels are, again, these network connections with a couple of channel handlers which, Im which implement the whole protocol. They implement the encryption, decryption. They implement the uh, HTTP request and response encoding and decoding. And the yellow handlers is what actually drives the application. So that would be the highest level bit of your application. What's unfortunate here is if that is our test case, we have eight handlers involved. Uh, six of which are written by Swift Neo, so you shouldn't need to test them again in your project because you would hope that we did that, did that job for you. We have a network that we don't really want. We really only want to test these yellow handlers. So that's not a really nice picture because most of the slide is really stuff that we don't want to test. And what makes it even worse is there's lots of things that mirror each other on the client the server. If you look at the first layer, SSL handler and SSL handler, they do exactly the opposite. One is encrypting, the other one is decrypting, and vice versa. So it would be nicer if we could remove them. Next layer in, HTTP request decoder, HTTP request encoder. That also looks like doing the exact opposite to me. So it would be kind of cool if we could remove those as well. And the story continues to HTTP response encoder and HTTP response decoder. So what if we could remove those as well? Then this would like, look like this. Unfortunately, that's not how it works. 
Well, Swift Neo is totally happy for you to sending arbitrary Swift data types through this channel pipeline. Once you hit the channel, once it needs to be sent over a network, it goes to the kernel, and the kernel doesn't know anything about Swift and doesn't know, want to know anything about Swift, and it just doesn't accept your data type. So that's not how it works. Thinking back, however, to our one byte at a time handler, there we perform quite a cool trick. We just put a handler in a certain position, and we intercepted some events and transformed those events. So why couldn't we do this instead? Couldn't we just take the, the handler that is normally implementing the server for our unit test case and pull it right in front of the client handler? Now, if the client writes some data, it goes through the outbound pipeline, so from right to left. The server can see whatever the client emitted, and it can, it can send data back to the client, pretending to that to be the output of the server, sending it back on the, on the inbound line. And that's quite powerful, because that way we can have these two handlers communicate, and this time there's no network involved, and no network means we have a much easier testing scenario. What's awkward here is we still have two channels and a network that we use for absolutely nothing. So the top channel and the whole network is used for nothing. We only bootstrap this to set up a channel, and we have only, communicating, we have only communication in that one channel. That doesn't really make, seem to make sense, and that's why Swift Neo provides you a data type called the embedded channel. The embedded channel is a channel that doesn't do any networking. To make it even better, it has synchronous API that's very easy to drive from your test cases to inject events on the inbound side as well as the outbound side and to read events that would have gone into the channel on either side into your unit test case. If we think about this for a moment, this pretend HTTP server that we put in there, we only put in there to intercept the events that the client sent us and to inject events that we want to respond to the client to, for the pretend server responses, either like 200 OK or internal server error, whatever scenario you want to come up with. Now I said we already have the synchronous API for testing in this embedded channel, so actually we can get a step further and do it like this with the embedded channel. We can literally put exactly this one handler that we would like to test in this embedded channel. To make it easier for you to use, the embedded channel has two buffers for the data that is coming out of the channel. It buffers the data here, so whenever you're ready, you can read it out of these buffers, and the other lines, the ones without these blobs, they are for you to inject events. And that means we can now basically test, not basically, we can test this handler in isolation without any non-determinism, without any threads. This runs in your thread. You can send all the events that you want to this handler, and you can read whatever events this handler produces. The APIs for that are also quite straightforward. To send something on the inbound side, you would call embedded channel write inbound. To read something off this buffer that, a, that the handler might have produced, you call channel.read inbound. To send an event um, into the outbound side, you call write outbound. And you might have guessed to read the outbound events out that the, the handler might have produced, you use the read outbound method. So that's kind of cool. Um, let's see how we could test this handler that drives this, um, this uh, translation API. What we would do is we would use the write outbound method to send a Swift data type object into this handler that expresses whatever this translation request is. In this case, again, this example from English to French text high that would go into this handler. And now we would use the read outbound method to, to inspect what the handler would, would have sent us. We are expecting this to be HTTP requests, and this is a representation of how Swift Neo represents HTTP requests before they get into encoded the wire format. The first bit is the head, where the, we have the URI, the headers, the verb, and all these things, HTTP version. The second part would be the body that contains the, uh, the, the string that we want to translate, followed by an end. To impersonate the server, that's pretty straightforward. We just read the request out, and through the write inbound method, we would send whatever our pretend server would do back again in a synchronous way. To set the, the handler would receive it straight away. But let's look at, uh, at some code first. If we wanted to write such a unit test, we would start with an embedded channel. Construction is pretty straightforward. If we, if we only have one handler, we can actually put this handler straight into the embedded channel. The next thing we do is construct this translation request and write it into the write outbound. We also assert that nothing throws in there. What would throw if the channel's closed or something like that? 
And now, what we've seen on the slide before, we pull three times on this read outbound because we would expect this handler to transform our translation request into a HTTP request, and that comes in three parts. So we pull three times and assign it to these local variables, followed by a comparison if what comes out of the handler is actually what we expect. And again, there's no network networking involved. Now we would impersonate the server. This is a test for the happy path. So we would send back 200 OK. We would create a body that can contain salut, and we write that back into the handler. And the only thing that's left is that the, the, the translation from this handler where it receives the HTTP response parts, and it should produce a response for the translation API. And that's exactly what it does. It would, oh, that's exactly what we're asserting here. We read um, on the inbound side in this case and con uh, on compare it to our expected response. To recap what we did, we put in this translation request. We asserted that it would produce the um, HTTP request um, 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 structures. We've sent in the HTTP response structures and asserted that it produced the expected um, translation response. Yeah, you can see that's quite powerful because now we can reduce our testing to this one layer only. There's no network involved, no threads, no non optimism If this works, it will always work. And if that works, and you tested obviously multiple scenarios, this is just one happy path, you would make maybe one where after receiving the, re the request, you just close the embedded channel that would emulate that the server crashed or close the connection on you. Um, you could make one where the server re responds internal server error, and you can come up with all the scenarios that you can, up can, can come up with. And if that works and you trust the new handlers work, you can compose them, and the, com the composite of that should also work because now we can reproduce every situation that your handler might encounter. Cool, let's move on to the next part. The specialized byte-to-message decoder testing tools. Byte-to-message decoders in Swift Neo are used whenever you want to parse a protocol. For example, the HTTP1 request decoder is a byte-to-message decoder. That means byte are coming, bytes are coming in, and you decode them into whatever stru Swift structure you, you want. Kind of similar-ish to um, the decodable part of, uh, of, of Codable, when you get some JSON and you decode it into a data object, except that it would normally be a little bit lower level, your own wire protocol. We could draw it like this. We have byte buffers going in, and we have whatever type coming out on the other side. That might still be byte buffer. We already learned how we can test these things. In this case, the handler is half height because it's only listening for inbound events, and we often draw them, draw them half height so that to make it clear that it doesn't do anything on the outbound side. We could use channel write inbound to send data in. Oh, sorry. We could use uh, write inbound to write data in and to read inbound and compare that what we, what, we, uh, what we expect actually happened. That's great. Unfortunately, all decoders have to repeat a certain set of tests all over again. Because if you think back to the beginning of this talk, TCP is stream-based, and we have these two extremes. A lot of data arrives in one read, or data arrives one byte at a time. These are test cases you will have to repeat for every byte to message decoder you write, because they are all supposed to work on streams. You have no idea in what chunk sizes your data arrives, but you, mu you must make sure that your decoder works in all kind of chunk sizes. So what if there was a tool that could automate that for you? And indeed, there is. Since I think Neo 2.8, we ship a byte-to-message decoder verifier for you. And how it works is you provide example inputs and outputs, uh, inputs and outputs, sorry, and it would validate that under all of these circumstances, they will actually work. So we'll send the data one byte at a time, or many messages in one time, and like we'll just make sure that whatever you provided as inputs holds under all circumstances that it can automatically reproduce. Internally, it does exactly the same thing that you would do. It creates a bunch of uh, embedded channels, puts this handler in, sets the, sends the data through, pulls it out, and, con uh, and compares it to whatever it expects. Some of the tricks it performs is one byte at a time, many messages in one, multiple randomized messages in random orders just to make sure you don't hold any state or you expect, you kind of know, oh, when, when I see this message, it's always followed by that message that you don't hold such state. It randomizes things. And you can then focus on the more unusual cases. You will probably not get away just writing one test case that just calls into byte to message you call a verifier, it does everything for you, that's not how it works. But you can focus on the few special cases that you cannot um, test with that. Again, let's have a 
uh, look at a little bit of code. The, um, that is some boilerplate. It's just like a helper function that takes a string and makes you a byte buffer con containing this string. And now we need to provide the sample input-output pairs. The test I want to, uh, the, 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 the decoder I want to test is the line-based frame decoder. That is one that ships in Swift Neo Extras. It's a very simple decoder. The only thing it does is it reads any data you send to it, and it sends you back each line in one go. So that is very helpful for line-based protocols. If you deal with any line-based protocols, like SMTP or something, you can just stick that um, line-based frame decoder into the pipeline, and you no longer need to worry with like, sh like uh, short reads or double like, or reads that were too long. You get exactly one line at a time. It also strips the new lines for you automatically. So let's provide some interesting test cases and let my two message decoder do the work. My first test case is I just provide a new line character and assert that the output is exactly one byte buffer with the empty string. It also handles um, the other new line, backslash r, backslash n. Again, we expect the same result. If we see a, backslash r, backslash n, we would expect just an a. If we see a, backslash r, backslash b, backslash n, we would expect to see what you can read on the slides. And the, the, then we have a more complete, more real world um, bit in the test case here, content length 17, new line, connection closed, new line, new line. Here, we would expect three byte buffers, one first line, second line, and third line. So these are the examples I provide. I would, uh, I would uh, probably provide like this. I guess it's a good set because they're quite interesting edge cases. And what uh, byte message decoder verifier would now do is construct lots of embedded channels, send in lots of data and loads of like different chunk sizes, randomize it, and just see if what you claim should be the input and the expected output is actually what it does. The only thing you need to do in your test case is uh, fail on throw um, because uh, byte message decoder verifier will throw at you with an error explaining what exactly went wrong. So for example, if your decoder emits too much stuff, then it will say unexpected production. If it emits the wrong thing, it will tell you, um, yeah, whatever, wrong pars. Like it will, it will give you a sort of readable uh, uh, um, explanation of what went wrong alongside the input that it sent to your handler that caused the problem, and that you can then copy and paste and make a regression test specifically for that input that once went wrong. Cool. The last thing I want to cover is specialized testing tools for HTTP 1-based server library libraries. The case study I want to use is an AWS S3 library. Totally fictitious. Doesn't exist. If you are smart, and you all are, then you would probably base the implementation of my S3 library on, a, on an HTTP client that already exists, for example, async HTTP client, or you could also use URL session. What we all know is if we write a client for something, we unfortunately also have to write a server because we want to test this thing. There is no way we are connecting to AWS in our test case because that would make it very slow, very unre unreliable, and our test farm suddenly needs the internet. And the, probably the worst bit is it's very hard to tell, to call up at AWS and tell them, can you please now send a 500 error because I want to test my library. That's not how it works. So you will need to write a server. I'm sorry. If you write a server in Swift Neo, this might look something like that. The picture is very similar. That's OK. That works just fine. It is not a unit test. It is an integration test. That is sometimes unfortunately necessary if the libraries don't give you the right hooks to put in the right stubs. Daniel earlier told us the gRPC library automatically produces these stubs for us, so that might not be necessary, but in many other libraries, we just don't have the stubs, so we do need to write an integration test. Totally possible with Neo, not super hard. What's kind of annoying is that this is a real network channel that will run on the event loop. That's a different thread. Everything is asynchronous. Your test case, however, wants to run through synchronously, so you have some pretty awkward synchronization work to do where if you want to, um, like the server needs to tell you, you know, test, oh yeah, I just received this from your client, and now please send that back, and for every test case, you need to bootstrap a new server because obviously every test case will have a server with a slightly different scenario, so you bootstrap all these things. What if we had a thing that could have an API that's very similar to the embedded channel and have, just for test purposes, a synchronous API at the back of the channel where you could kind of remote control the end of the channel. So you could read out with read inbound whatever this, the, the HTTP request parts that your library should have sent, and if you use write outbound, you would be able to send back the response part to your library, and all that would be synchronous. Good news is, 
in NEO 2.9.0, we shipped a uh, component called NEO HTTP 1 test server, which comes in the NEO test utils package, just like um, the byte to message decoder verifier, and it implements exactly that. The great thing about this is it's really easy to write these tests, and you can take over the server part just like you would in an embedded channel, but you're actually doing real network, networking, but you wouldn't really notice it. Let's look at how code for that could look like. And you might, be, you might probably re like remember a bunch of that code from before. It starts with a little bit of boilerplate, because this time we actually do need to have some localhost networking, at least. We boot up our HTTP1 test server on an event loop group. This group needs to be real. We shut it down at the end. Now we boot up our fictitious um, AWS S3 library, tell it to connect to localhost on, the, on whatever port the, this test web server chose. The next thing is we want to invoke an operation on our S3 client, like let's just take the put object method with like, the right parameters as an example here, and get, we get back a future of the result. Now we know this S3 library under the covers will have probably used async HTTP client to make a HTTP request to our server, and that we should be able to read with this. We call read inbound on this HTTP 1 test server, and we get back exactly one request part. We do that again, and we get back another request part. And guess what? We do that again, and we get back the third request part. We, con we compare them all to what we expect. And now, again, we can impersonate whatever the server would do. We would say, all right, let's, on the outbound side, send you back this head, in this case, 200 OK, and the end. Same as before, if we wanted to reproduce that AWS has an internal server error, we just put status internal server error. If you wanted to reproduce that AWS uh, crashed or your network went down or like connection got closed somehow, we just shut down this web server in the middle of the test case. And then at the end, we just assert that our AWS S3 library does whatever we want it to do. This is the happy, test pa happy case path. Um, therefore, we would expect that this result that way does not throw. If we did something bad, like internal server error, we would now expect this to probably throw an error. Or if you have built-in retries, you could now assert that it sends another request to your web server, very much like what we saw above. Cool. Some closing thoughts. So think in channel handlers. They allow you to create and emulate almost any scenario. All events in Swift Neo travel the ch channel pipeline and through channel handlers, not just data. I was mostly focusing on the channel read event that tells you our data has been read, process it, and the write event where you command the action that writer data has to be written. But in, the, in, in, in fact, all events travel through the channel pipeline. For example, if the connection gets closed and we learn about it, and Swift Neo will send you an inbound channel inactive event through the channel pipeline, and you process it. And all those events you can send in any situation you want. Try to have many unit tests, testing exactly one component. That way, your tests are the shortest, the fastest, and you can test the most scenarios. You definitely want to back them up, however, with integration tests. You want to have many unit tests, testing all the scenarios, and a few integration tests to back everything up. In some cases, where you're missing the stubs, you might want to use a component similar to a Neo HTTP 1 test server. It's open source. You can look at the source. Then make use of the Neo test utils, which provides helpers. And like, it's a growing collection of helpers, such as the byte to message decoder verifier, as well as the Neo HD1 test server. And please also help us design more testing tools. That's the great thing about open source. We want to know if you struggle testing a certain, a certain scenario, or if the tests are getting too awkward, or whatever the problem is, talk to us. Maybe we have a good solution how you can test it today. And maybe we can design something for Neo or for another package to make testing simpler. In fact, the Neo HG1 test server came out of a colleague of mine walking to my desk and saying, so we don't have any tests for a certain library. What should we do? We started writing it the traditional way. We booted up these servers. It worked, but every test case was guessing 80 to 100 lines and lots of promises to like, get the data from the asynchronous thing in our test case. And then we thought, we can do better. It would be much nicer if this behaved like an embedded channel. We knew in this case we couldn't use an embedded channel, but we would like to have the properties of an embedded channel, and so we created Neo H1 test server. That component is strictly only for testing. It can do a grand total of one concurrent request at a time, but that's usually enough for tests. And for the, some test cases where you do actually need multiple concurrent requests, 
you can still boot up your server and do it the traditional way. Or you might want to extend Neo H1 test server and maybe have support for multiple requests. There's so many options what you could do. That is everything I have. Uh, I thank you very much for your attention, and I, th I hope that was uh, useful. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.